and a fine usher there will run one over to you, and that will be yours to keep. Uh, we need a couple over here on the uh, north side of the cathedral. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Proverbs 31. And we're going to read Proverbs 31, the whole thing. If you go to right about the middle of your Bible, slight right, we'll be in Proverbs, the last proverb, Proverb 31, and we will... Focus on every verse of that chapter. Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 1, thus saith the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women your ways to those who destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to the one who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. An excellent wife, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold to the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength. And dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household. And does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also. And he praises her. Many women have done excellently. But you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. And beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. I want to take as a theme and a title for this right out of verse 30. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be in your presence, to be standing amongst your redeemed, to be standing amongst friends, some who've come because it's Mother's Day, some who've been visiting, investigating the claims of God in Christ. We thank you for your spirit that is here with us. We thank you for your word that is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of our soul and our spirit. And we thank you 
that we can come with high expectations and anticipations of you moving in us, of you affecting change in our hearts, in our minds, of you transforming things, though they be old, maybe, maybe even things that have been there for generations. We thank you that you show glimpses of your glory and snippets of your splendor through your creation. Woman. And in that special and particular office of, of mother, we celebrate you. We've come to worship you for this and many other reasons. I ask you, Lord, your comfort upon those who find today to be a particularly painful day. Those mothers who've sent babies on ahead to glory. Those men and women here who've sent parents, mothers, into eternity. For those whose relationships with mothers or mothers' relationships with children have been, have been painful, pray that you would come and not just comfort, but give direction so that the future can be different. There is so much that you can yet do. And I pray that our hearts would be disposed to obey your word. Lord, I need you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you very much. Um, I heard something uh, a few seconds ago <coughs> that I anticipated, and, uh, and particularly on today was... It was a pretty surefire bet I'd get. I, 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 I thought that when I mentioned to us, let's open our Bibles to Proverbs 31, there would be some, go, some groans, some, some gasps. Um, and if you didn't react audibly, maybe your heart kind of clenched a little bit if you know the Bible at all. Um, this is that passage in which we find the famous proverb 31 woman we've made up a, a name for her and this is true that there's a portion of what we read that mentions uh, a woman of excellence and virtue and um but i i want to first before we go or so that we can go any further help us to dispel some of the tension because some of us it, it it when you heard that we're going to go into proverb 31 um, some defenses went up, some regrets came to mind, um, thoughts that perhaps weren't entirely pleasant. Uh, I, I'm going to invite you to, to drop that. This is not that message. As a matter of fact, this is not that proverb that comes to beat guilt on imperfect women. This is not some lofty and unreasonable ideal that comes to make women feel badly. Now, it contains direction for sure that when compared to our lives, I think men themselves could read this passage and feel areas of conviction when we speak of the godliness of, of, of such a woman. And so uh, I'm going to invite you, though, to, to have an open heart for what God has to say and take the focus on off of what maybe you'd like to defend or not talk about. And let's just let God minister, amen? Um, so please, ladies, moms, future moms, spiritual moms to other women in the faith, um, let God comfort you, let God encourage you, uh, perhaps correct you and so that he might be glorified through you as this uh, passage paints a picture that I think we all need to see um, again, this is not some, some pie-in-the-sky kind of an ideal that he paints, that he has no intention of giving women the grace to reach for and grow into. Okay, this is not just God saying, it'd be nice if women could be something like this, but I really have no expectation, and I really have no power to help you be this woman. Now, 
along the way, gentlemen, now Father's Day is coming, but along the way, even today, there's some really deep and necessary instruction for us. And how could there not be if, if these women are to be in one flesh union with us? So I think everybody can be blessed today if we just, if we just let God move. Men, fathers, husbands, husbands to be, fathers to be. Um, I want you to hear the counsel here of a wise woman, as we'll see, to a man. This is actually this Proverb 31 passage that women read and cringe and say we like, but you really hate. This is actually a passage that is repeating counsel from a woman to her son. So it's really written initially. These words were voiced to men. So don't check out, fellas. This is, this is good for us. And uh, furthermore, um, you know, men, we should, we should really read passages like this in light of other passages like Ephesians 5 that tells us that our responsibility is to build our wives and to wash them in the water of the word and to see the wrinkles and spots that might be there, anything that might need areas of, of growth, anything that might need attention. And so if we look at this, don't, don't gloat and don't get this I told you so kind of a spirit when you see something pointed out in a passage like this that may point to a weakness in your wife. No, let it be an indictment against us that we have not addressed those issues in a godly fashion and help to make those things be rectified as well. So, gentlemen, um, stay, stay with us today, um, which brings us to now our, our first verse. And we're not going to go verse by verse, but we need to look at the first verse before we cover uh, a few truths here. Now, it says, the words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. So there's this mention of this of this King Lemuel. He's not mentioned in the lineage of, of all the kings of Judah or of Israel. He's not a, a Hebrew king, if you take his name to be a, a literal name of a person. Um, he's a much debated individual when you look at, when you listen to, to, to Bible scholars. Uh, the Jewish tradition is that Lemuel is not an actual personal name of somebody, but it's, it's just a, a, a nickname that Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, gave to him because Lemuel simply means, the name means devoted to God. And so it was just kind of a term of endearment, they say, that, that Bathsheba used when she spoke to Solomon. She called him Lemuel, reminding him that you've been devoted to God. And there was a lot of times in Solomon's life where he could have used that reminder. You've been devoted to God. And so um, there's, uh, there, there's that, that idea in the Jewish tradition that this is merely speaking of Solomon, or there are those scholars who just by a slight variation in the translation come to the um, conclusion that this is not a Hebrew king at all, but he actually was likely an Arab king, king of Massa, and we won't go into all the translation uh, intricacies there, but that he was a king, but nonetheless the truths are true and they were included into the canon of, of scripture for us, and it was Counsel from a woman who, though not a Hebrew, had come to know and love the one true living Jehovah and was giving godly advice to her then son, whose name was actually Lemuel. So here's the, case, here's the thing, though, is that no matter what, no matter what the case is, no matter who this Lemuel actually is, these words of maternal wisdom were, were preserved by God and included in the scriptures and protected over thousands of years that we might have them here today. And so let's lend our attention to them really closely. And the first lesson really comes right in that first verse because it says, as we mentioned a minute ago, this is an oracle that his mother taught him. You could even, you could even translate that word oracle to mean a prophecy, a prophetic word from a mother to a son. This is something divine in its origin coming through maternal lips to a son. So already we see some things that we could just gather from a, a simple reading of that first verse. Number one, she must have been of some fine character that this son thought it important enough to take his mother's words, his mother's counsel, and to record them and to keep them for posterity. 
to, to say mom's words matter. This must have been a woman of just very, very high, high caliber. This must have been a woman of, of, of great, great morality and godliness and piety. And so when she spoke, he thought, this is something I don't want to forget, nor do I want the, the generations to come to forget. So, so here they are recorded. How many of you have written down the stuff mom said? So her fine character warranted her, her son valuing her words that way. And so when we read it, there's a certain motherly grace and strength to these words that I hope the Holy Spirit will convey to you. You're going you're gonna to hear them coming from this fuzzy face, but I hope you can hear a, a mother's tenderness, that, that, that godliness that is reflected best in, in, in femininity and in, and in motherhood. I hope you can hear that. It might sound familiar because some of you had some very godly mothers. It might be something new to you. That it's not coming in a shrill scream or in a, in a cruel word. But, but know this, that, that that motherly grace, whether it was there or not in your upbringing, it's of God. And so begins to lay out, starting in verse 2 through verse 9. It's actually, this proverb is in two pieces. And the first part is, is verses 2 through 9 where the mother begins to speak to her son, and she speaks to him about what it is to be an excellent man, or specifically an excellent leader, an excellent king. It's counsel that springs from a, a deep, godly love. And it's both, okay? A lot of mothers have a deep love for their sons, deep love for their daughters, but that's not the same thing as a deep and godly love. A love that is governed and made wise by the truths of God. Not just run on some mama bear instinctive protectiveness. But a kindness and a gentleness and a wisdom that comes from God himself. And so he opens in that second verse by three times asking the question of her son. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? That might sound familiar to some of you moms if you've had sons. You may have said it many more times than three. But she calls him to some introspection. She calls him to pause and stop and think about, what are you doing? Really, really, where are you headed? What is the condition of your soul? It's, it's reminiscent of God coming to Adam in the garden. Adam, where are you really? Not because I don't know where you are, but I want you to stop and focus on your condition. Where are you? What are you doing? It is a godly mother that helps to bring pause to her children's life and say, stop, think a little bit. What are you doing? And she refers to him with, she, she leverages this relationship so that she can really get his attention, so that she can set him up to hear everything subsequent to this. She uses every bit of leverage she has, and she calls upon three different facets of their relationship. She says, what are you doing, my son? She asserts that, that lasting bond between a mother and her son. Furthermore, she says, son of my womb, what are you doing? She reminds him of love that she gave him before he was even born. Before he drew his first breath of air, she was loving, feeding, caring for, thinking of. Maternal love starts way before your birthday. And she reminds him of that. You're the son of my womb. There was a time where we could not have been closer. She leverages this because what I'm about to say, you need to hear. And so I'm going I'm I'm to push every button I can. I'm going to use all the leverage I can because I need your attention, son, because I've got good wisdom to share with you. Mothers, godly mothers will use everything at their disposal to put godliness and piety into their children. Furthermore, she says, what are you doing, son of my vows? And she reminds him that before you were born, I made some commitments to the Lord. I prayed. I dedicated you. Though I loved you, I put you in his hands. This is not just between the two of us. This is happening before the eyes of the God with whom I have cut covenant regarding you. Good, godly mothers know as much as I love this child, I put him in hands that love him even more than I do. And she reminds him of all these things. You're my son, the son of my womb, the son of my vows. What are you doing? Listen to what I'm about to say. And then she goes on to give him good counsel, great counsel. As a matter of fact, we won't spend a lot of time on this first portion so that we can spend more time on the second portion, but, but we've got to touch it. 
It's so good. It's a mother's wise warning, first of all, to her son to not have an unholy view of women and of marriage. Oh, that's good advice. Timely advice. Increasingly necessary advice that godly women sit and speak to their children. And yes, specifically, even to their sons. Sons need to hear from a godly mother. And she speaks to him in verse 3. Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. She's not speaking to her son against having a wife. She's not speaking against women in general. What she's doing is speaking to him about a bad and a prevalent view amongst royalty in that day where women were seen as objects. They were collected like little trinkets. And she says to him, you cannot honor God and go about collecting a harem. Notice the word is in the plural. She says, do not give your strength to women. Don't have more than one wife that you would dedicate your life to. Don't have your affections spread out. Don't let your desires and your appetites lead you astray. Don't bring other women into this. This is not what marriage is. This is not how you're to view women. So many men today view women as so much less than they are and would have been blessed to have a mother and, yes, a father who taught them the proper view of how God, why God created women, of the image of God that women bear, and how men are called to protect, provide for, lead, and bless women. And she does a good job, and she tells him, this is not for multiple women. Your heart is to be singular. Back in those days, they used to have all these political weddings just for the sake of, of commerce, just for the sake of, of creating peace treaties, and they'd marry princesses from all over the place and, and, and important people's daughters from all over the place just to kind of secure contracts and keep the, the commerce flowing. And she says, no, women are more than that. Furthermore, Son of mine, if you go about collecting women, if you go about going around with all manner of women from all manner of places, you will find yourself with a collection of women who do not honor the God that you should be honoring, and they will lead your heart astray. And it came to fruition in the life of Solomon, if you recall. But a godly man, she's telling him, should marry a godly woman. I don't care what she looks like. I don't care how much money she has. I don't care how her eyes sparkle. Your soul will wander if she is not passionately in love with the God that you love. In fact, she ought to love that God more than she loves you, boy. She says that there are those who destroy kings. Solomon's kingdom suffered horribly for not following this kind of counsel. Furthermore, it's godly, a godly mother's wise warning against alcoholism specifically and by extension, any kind of intoxication, anything that would take the wits from a man. She says in verse 4, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all of the afflicted. Give strong drink to those who are perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. She, she tells him, she points out to him that he is in a position of leadership. All men are in a position of leadership, whether they know it or not, accept it or not, whether they embrace it or abdicate it, all men are in a position of leadership. And when a man chooses to lose his wits because he turns to a bottle instead of to a glorious God, when he finds his peace and his rest in a syringe or a pipe, instead of on his knees in the presence of his loving Father, he loses his wits and his decision-making processes are hindered. And when a man makes a bad decision, others suffer. She tells him that. I thought this was a Mother's Day message, Pastor. Oh, I'm blessing moms right now if the guys will grasp this. All kinds of homes would be blessed if men would lay hold of this thing and let it lay hold of them. She's saying that when you lose 
the acuity of your thoughts and your decision-making process. It's not just about you. Everything you do sends ripples. You are made in the likeness and the image of God. You are Adam's sons. You are Christ's disciples. Everything you do sends ripples. And women bear the scars today of a lot of bad decisions. A lot of men who have turned to other things that have dulled their decision-making processes. Addictions of all kinds, and she warns him against them. It's good counsel. It's good counsel from a mother. It's a mother's wise exhortation toward compassion. She's teaching her son an important lesson to be selfless. Men suffer from selfishness. 40-year-old boys walking around. She says in verse 8, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. She doesn't merely call on him to just cause no harm. Just don't start trouble. No, no, no. She says, find trouble, take up the cause, and fight for what's right. That's what a man does. He doesn't just keep his nose clean. He finds areas where others have not kept their nose clean, where others are being afflicted, where others are being abused. He takes up their cause and he deals in justice and mercy. She calls him toward this. Because a lot of mothers know the pain of watching their sons grow up, their daughters grow up, to be self-serving, narcissistic, self-lovers. And we've got a world that would do nothing but applaud that attitude. It takes a godly mother. This world where mothers are trying to give this counsel is not friendly to this. It teaches teaches something quite the opposite. And too many mothers have adopted the views of the world around us where we tell our children that the most important thing is that you get to get a good education so you can get a good job, so you can get a good check, so you can get all the good things you want. And she says, no, no, no. Your income, your wages are going to have to have a higher purpose than that. She says, have an open hand towards those who are in need. Learn right now from an early age, just because it's in your pocket doesn't mean it's for you. Just because God put it on a check that says pay to the order of your name does not mean that he does not have designs upon that check and purposes for that money and for your skills and for your talents. Men need to realize it's not just about them. And from this portion, we, we've heard a kind of strength and mother addressing subjects that mothers need to address. And too many times I hear nowadays, and it's true, and believe me, I said Mother, Father's Day is coming. I, I, I cannot, but, but, but too many women are even saying, go to your father, you're a boy. Let your dad raise you. No, every man needs that touch of a godly woman. He won't know how to love his own woman. He won't know what to look for in a woman if he doesn't have a godly woman speaking into his life. She needs to speak. She needs to speak strongly, but she needs to speak in wisdom and not just her mere opinions. Sometimes that's a hard thing to do. But then she goes further and she speaks to an area of his life that would affect all of his life. And she speaks about not just being an excellent man, but now the the proverb changes. And from verse 10 all the way through verse 31, she speaks now of having an excellent wife. So remember, before we get to this portion and you say, oh, this is the part where I don't measure up, this is the counsel of a godly woman to her son. Already learn the lesson. Be a godly woman who speaks wisdom to your children. Follow, I don't even know Lemuel's mother's name. It might be Bathsheba, it might not, but it doesn't matter, does it? Insert your name there. That you would speak to your children, that you would speak to your sons, that you would speak to your daughter's words of wisdom and now she goes into something important and she says that he should know how to discern an excellent wife desire an excellent wife and care for an excellent wife it's counsel that springs from a good woman about a good woman it's from a good woman about a good woman now this is a an especially beautiful piece of artwork here because 
from verse 10 to verse 31, it's a poem. It loses much in translation from Hebrew to English, but it's actually an acrostic. You'll see that a couple times even in the psalm, Psalm 119, where they will take every line of that poem will begin with subsequent letters in the Hebrew alphabet or alphabet. And so every line, the first one would begin, if it were in English, would begin with A. The second line would begin with B. So it's written with some artistry about it. But it's not just artistry for the sake of a beautiful poem. The Hebrews used to do this, and they used to write these poems in acrostics so they would be more easily memorized. Because the counsel she's about to give is not just some beautiful poem that you can enjoy for the moment and then walk away. She wants this to be ingrained on the tablets of her son's heart. Good counsel should always be. So that should tell you something. As we go into this, grasp it. Let God etch it on your soul. Men, if you're unmarried that you would seek out, insist upon such a woman. God is still making such women. If you're married, help your wife, lead your wife into this kind of excellence and godliness, men. Women, look at this. Rejoice in that God is calling you to something better and greater. Trust Him to do the work. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Proverbs 31, every Mother's Day that you read that should look a little more like you. Because you lean on His everlasting arms. So He says, don't forget this. And So we begin the second part. And... This aid to help us memorize things is because this mother wanted this to be something that he carried with him in his courtship, in his married life. And this mother was setting her son up for finding and rejoicing in that excellent God-fearing wife. I mean, isn't that really the, the high goal of every mother? And I'm asking that Just a little bit of not being completely authentic there. Because I know the answer is lamentably not yes. It's not every woman that is looking to raise up their child to be a person of character, a person of excellence, who will marry another person of excellence. There are mothers who, for their own self-serving purposes, cannot cut umbilical cords and try to sabotage every effort of their son or daughter moving on. There are those who measure prospective daughter-in-laws by everything but the Word of God. What you like, what you think. This Lemuel's mother is using the standard that is God's. Because she wants him to know the joy that God intended for marriage. I mean, isn't that the whole goal? Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way they should go. I mean, isn't that it? And that they should go into the arms of a godly spouse and raise up godly progeny. And you know the joy of being two generations back and saying, look at this beautiful lineage. And having the satisfaction of knowing that I spoke wisdom into this. So the order of these statements is, is determined by, yes, God's providential hand and the Hebrew alphabet, and so um, just having read this, just, just on the surface, there's some real valuable truths. You know, a mother can and must be wise. A mother must speak even to their sons. She teaches her son uh, about being wise and just in verses 2 through 9, but then when we get now to verses 10 through 31, she teaches her son some, some things that really must have taken some preparation to say. I mean, really think about it. If you're going to stop And you're going to tell your son to look for this kind of woman, insist on this kind of woman, cherish this kind of woman, help to build this kind of a woman. You know that the first question in his mind was the first question on your mind. Am I this kind of woman? That that fear of hypocrisy where she's thinking, oh my God, how can I tell him look for a godly woman when maybe I wasn't? So there's some introspection involved here. 
mother has to have some excellence going for her in order to speak words like these with any kind of credibility. So if Lemuel is to be understood as being Solomon himself, then this means these words are coming from Bathsheba. Bathsheba saying, pick a woman of integrity. Pick a woman of character. Pick a woman of excellence. Pick a woman who fears God. Pick a woman who, who, who cares for her family and is loyal to her husband. And yet Bathsheba, if you'll recall, was caught up in a horrible, adulterous scandal with King David. And yet she turns to her son. And where does she get the gall to tell him to seek out excellence in a wife? It comes from something called redemption. And I want to talk to the mothers who feel like you are handicapped or muzzled or handcuffed to the point where I can't say anything to, to, anything to my children because I've made too many mistakes. If you've come to Jesus, old things are passed away because all things are new. And you need to come to your children with your resume, though as stained as it might be, and say, look what Jesus did in my life, but now I know wisdom and I will be faithful to pass it along to you. If you need to learn from my wisdom and my mistakes, let it be, but go on. Go on, son. Go on, daughter, into wisdom and into a life better than what you've seen. So, mother, if you're saying, well, I've made too many mistakes and I can't have that effect, you're wrong. Jesus is bigger than your past. Repent, turn to him, be washed white as snow, and turn and pour out this wisdom, even if it's newfound wisdom to you, even if, if this afternoon is the first time you have that wise conversation with your child. Have it! It is your duty and your pleasure. So, if there's conviction in anyone here today, and as you read the virtues of this excellent woman, I want you to rejoice. I want you to rejoice because that's the Holy Spirit saying, this is where we're going to work. This is where I'm going to build you. It's a conviction that causes repentance and growth and not condemnation and hopelessness, okay? Now, let me pause again to, to, to recall. We are reading the wise words of a mother to her son. Not a chauvinistic, unreasonable, cruel joke of males setting some unattainable standard. This is God's word through a godly mother to her son. These are the words of a woman. Ladies ought to be inspired by the counsel of this mother. They ought to be encouraged by the description she gives. Men ought to listen closely. So we'll speak today of just, there's so much we can say. I was looking at this chapter and I thought, oh my God, where do I stop? I'm just going to preach on this verse and just maybe just this portion and and the hardest thing was what, what to leave out. But let me, just, let me just talk to you about eight easily observed excellencies, characteristics, qualities of this woman that are especially notable and, and easy to see. First, first of all, verse 10 tells us that, that an excellent wife, a God-fearing wife, she's rare. An excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. And if this was true in those ancient times, how much more true is it today? That a woman of virtue and character who values God, His Word, His priorities above all else, selfless, not selfish, selfless, not self-absorbed. If back in these ancient days, those women were, were rare and precious and not common. Without music, telling women to be angry, man-hating feminists. Without the marketplace, telling women that you're nothing if we can't measure you in dollars. If they were rare back then, they're all the more rare today. And marriages and children have suffered increasingly ever since the writing of this proverb. 
And though she is uncommon, this does not mean that God has adopted the majority view. What God called excellent then, he calls excellent now. And I have proof all over this room today that God is still making excellent mothers and women. And here, Lemuel's mother describes such an excellent, God-fearing woman so her son wouldn't settle for less and so that we won't either. She's rare. So if, if you're planning on being a godly woman, if you're planning on letting God form you into this, don't expect a lot of company. Don't expect a lot of applause. Don't expect all the other women in the neighborhood. Don't expect everybody else in society to say, that's great. I think it's really great how you're going totally against the culture. I think it's really great how you are taking higher priorities and you are serving others above yourself. I don't expect it. You won't be in vast company, but you will be in elite company. Something else that we see just plainly in verse 13 is she's a joyous woman. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. You know that, that, that phrase, willing hands, in, in the Greek, is, 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 it could be equally translated, she works with joy, delight, and extreme satisfaction. Doing what? Getting wool and flax? Where's, where's the joy in that? It sounds very menial, right? I mean, really. You're not going to see an article in Cosmo about how great it is to go and gather wool and flax and loom your fabric and sew clothes for your kids. That, that gets mocked. And where's she getting her joy from? She's joyous because she gets the big picture. She's joyous because she knows what she's doing, whether everybody else gets it or not. She's joyous because she sees the value in her occupation. She sees the advancement of the kingdom of God and the discipleship of her children and the tending to her family. She sees it, and she doesn't need anybody else's applause. She doesn't need anybody else to approve of it. She's doing it with willing hands. She's doing it with extreme satisfaction. She's going about it with great joy because she finds her affirmation in the smile of her God and the praise of a godly husband. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right if the other ladies at the mall don't think I've got it all together. It's all right if the other girls down the street don't think that I've got it all together. It's all right if we're not pushing a $2,000 stroller and our baby's wearing Gucci diapers. You know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because I've got the approval, the affirmation, the blessing, and the joy that comes with doing this all before the eyes of my God and a, go and a godly husband. She does it with willing hands and she's joyful about it. Furthermore, she's She's self-sacrificing and has a servant's heart. You know, again, that is not what the world is applauding and calling for. Not out of women, not out of anybody. You're not going to find that in the lyrics of, of, of the latest song by the latest female pop star. It's, it's, it's all about who I am and how I don't need anybody. And how it's about me and I'm going to take care of me and, and I got to get mine. And it's, it's, it's all about me showing how good I am. It's about me displaying my wares and my goods for my glory. And here, it's quite the opposite. See, servanthood isn't applauded in the world. But yet in the scriptures, it's the ideal. Yet in the scriptures, it's, it's exactly who Jesus is. Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The king's mother describes a woman with such a Christ-like quality. I hear women frustrated often. What about me? I'm so glad Jesus didn't say that on the cross. I'm so glad that on Good Friday that was not the eighth 
word that he said. Now, granted, women should be cared for. Yes, granted, women are a, are, 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 are a limited resource. We're not saying you're nuclear-powered and you should just go on and on and on. But the reason that you go on and on must be great and it must be Christ-like and it must be others. Despite what the world is telling you. Verses 15 through 18 of Proverbs 31. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. Her lamp does not go out at night. It speaks of a long day. She wakes up before the sun comes up and she goes to bed after the sun's gone down. And, and that, those are bookends to a very full day as we'll see as we read the rest of that proverb. She is all about it. Why? Others. Her husband, her children... It says her maidens, her employees, so much is going on that she's even gotten to the point where she's had to hire help. She also takes care of the poor and the needy. But notice it says she rises. That means she laid down too. She did sleep. We're not talking about suicide or martyrdom. There's nothing good about a mother who is so utterly sleep-deprived and doesn't eat right. Matter of fact, that's not a mother you want to be around. <laughs> but yet her thoughts and her efforts are for others. And it's beautiful and it's right and it's totally against the current of our culture. She's not primarily striving for herself. She's not hanging on to the motto of the day, where it's, it's you first, girl. You take care of you. You can't love nobody till you take care of yourself. You go to the spa, and then you can feed the kids. I don't see Jesus anywhere in that. No. She's a wise woman. Matter of fact, verse 21 tells us that she has wise and courageous foresight. She's looking ahead. She's not just living in the here and now. She's not one of those ladies that just sucks her thumb and says, oh, woe is me, and I don't have everything just the way I want. This isn't how I imagined it when I was in college. Verse 21, she is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Do you hear what it said? You, get, you can't miss the context here. Here is a woman living somewhere in the area of Palestine, and it says she is geared up for when the snow comes. How often does it snow in Palestine? Almost never. But if it did, that'd be the ready woman. Foresight. The ability to look ahead. The, the ability to not get so stuck in the here and in the now. And how imperfect it is. She keeps the big picture. She's looking ahead and she's trusting God for it. She's made sure that her family is well prepared. And you can't do that on Facebook. In verse 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the time to come. You see that? She laughs at the days that are to come. News says it's going to get bad. News says the job market. News says the economy is tanking. There's wars and rumors of wars, and she laughs. Why? My trust is somewhere else. She's not depressed. She's not anxious. She's not fearful about tomorrow. Too many women are living on the edge of despondency, the edge of depression because what if here's a what if what if God is true what if God's promises are forever what if he is the shepherd he promised to be there's a what if what if God is glorious what if God promised to be with you and he'll be with you low even until the end of the age what if what if, he, what if he helps you in your mothering what if he helps you in your finances what if he helps you in your marriage what if there's a what if. Let that one keep you up at night. Let that one fill your thoughts. She laughs at the day to come. She trusts the Lord as, and, and is obedient to his commandments and is diligent in her, in her faithful following of his word. And so she has no reason to be afraid. Something else about her that we see. She works hard and smart. I found myself doling out that conventional wisdom to my son every once in a while when I see him going about something 
a very difficult and awkward way. I tell them, no, buddy, do it like this. Work smart, not hard. It's not good counsel. The best counsel is work smart and hard. Do a lot of smart things. Do a lot of things with wisdom. Fill your days with hard, wise work. And this woman does that exactly. She does it in all kinds of theaters. At home and outside of her home. Verse 27. She looks well to the ways of her household. There's the intelligence. And does not eat the bread of idleness. There's hard work. She's observant, she's circumspect, she's watching, she's aware, she knows what's going on. You know, and, and, I mean, you come on, you know how moms are. Mom, where's the... And you know she's going to know. <laughs> mom, are we out of... And you can expect a good answer from a good mom. She's circumspect. She's watching, she's aware, she's on top of things. Not just the grocery list. Not just, is that bill paid? But she's on top of things. The spiritual condition of her children. The temperature in her marriage. The, th the thermometer in her own soul. I spent time with God? Have I been in the Word? Am, am I a woman of prayer? Am I, am I a woman of kindness? And she's, she's honest and she's, she knows what's going on in her household, all of her household. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. That's an interesting phrase. She does not try to draw some kind of strange sustenance out of doing nothing. She does not try and feed herself on the bread of idleness. I just need to relax. What I need is just, I just need to, 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 to I just need some me time. I just, and, and there's a time for that if it's meditative, if it's spent in prayer. But, but when your, your child imagines you 15 years from now, don't let it be you standing with those loving motherly hands wrapped around an iPhone, head cocked down. And she's not eating the bread of idleness. She's not wasting, squandering, poorly stewarding the vapor that is this life. My God, I just had one of my babies, my baby, my first baby turned 11 a couple of days ago. In a few weeks, the, my, the child of my old age is going to be three. You know, there's really not time for that bread. There's a lot of will, the wisdom to put in there. There's a lot, of, a lot of correction to do in here. To have time for the tomfoolery that so many people are caught up in today, it's frightening. Mothers, please, we beg you. If others have time to tinker around and Google this and chase that, fine. If it's productive, if it's going somewhere, but not as some kind of a strange therapeutic replacement for time with Jesus. Not strolling the corridors and aisles of the mall. I just need to go shopping. No, she doesn't eat that bread. She feeds on something better. I was sharing with someone the other day. If you ever read the biographies of great men, you'll soon find that somewhere in their memoirs there's mention of a great mother. John Wesley once said, I have learned more from my mother than from all of the theologians in England. Susanna Wesley had 19 children. Didn't live in a 19-bedroom home either. And she would sometimes, to get time with God, sit a chair right in the middle of the kitchen and pull her apron up over her head. And all the children knew, shh, there might not be a special room for that. But mom creates a little tabernacle with her apron. And everybody knew, mom's with 
God. And the children would police one another. You don't make noise when mom's praying. Mom's talking to Jesus. It was like when Moses walked into the tabernacle, the people would stand back and they knew this is important to mom. How many of our mothers come out face glowing from having been in the presence of God and the children just fall into line in a way that your screaming could never achieve? Now at home, she was, she was not tied up with such things. But her virtue could not just be in the home. And it's sad to say that the, the home gets painted nowadays as a jail cell. I've had, I've had young girls say, home. Oh, no, I can't be at home. I can't be at home for anything. I'm sorry. I'm, are, we, are we carrying the same Bible? That God touts the beauty, the sanctuary that is the home, and you find it a jail cell? You find it some oppressive, stifling place? It's not what the scripture says. And when done right, it's not a place where you must be locked down. Matter of fact, the virtues, the excellencies of this woman could not fit inside any one house. And it showed up with all her dealings, even outside of the house. Verses 14 through 17, she is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She considers a field and buys it. And with the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. It speaks of a woman who's making it happen. But home is still home base. Home is still the focal point. She goes out, she shops. It's not saying she's a merchant. It's not saying she's a sailor. It uses this analogy to say that she shops well. She knows where the good ingredients are. She knows where the good prices are, where the good fabrics are found, where all the good wares for her family are. And she goes about acquiring and procuring those things in such a way that she blesses the home. It all comes back to the home. And it says that she goes about it in a very industrious way. This woman's amazing. I stand amazed at women. I mean, in, in, in a world where you, you hear the phraseology, it shows up now in our, our common vernacular. I, I was sitting at the coffee shop the other day, and I heard a woman say it, and it, it kind of just broke my heart. Standing in line waiting for her, whatever her high maintenance drink was. And, 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 and another lady asks her, so what do you do? And she said, oh, I'm just a stay-at-home mom. And I thought, you just downplayed a job that I couldn't do well on my best day. You just, in one fell swoop, knocked a skill set that a lot of women avoid because they've not built it. Or even, even worse, more asinine is, oh, I don't work. <laughs> you don't work. No, she's a masterful manager. She's, she's a businesswoman. She's a woman of business. She makes it happen. She's wise. She's sharp. I stand in awe of well-run homes. And all this, she makes her arm strong. She does not quit. She pushes herself, trusting on the strength that God gives. Furthermore, she's charitable. She knows the heart of God towards the suffering and the needy. Verse 20 says, she opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. This sounds nothing like Beyonce songs, huh? So much love, so much grace, so much wisdom. Our house leaks it into the community, she says. So much compassion, so much presence of God that it couldn't just stay in our family. It just reaches out, it just leaks out, it just makes a difference in the world around her. Furthermore, she understands and rightly uses the power of words. 
Verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Again, let me pause and say, these are words from a godly woman about a godly woman. This is a woman saying, I really appreciate and wish you would look for, son, a woman who knows how to properly use words. What the Proverbs call a woman of discretion. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She uses words with wisdom both in quantity and in quality. There's, there's got to be a wisdom in the quantity of words spoken or texted or emailed. Proverbs 10, 19 says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. You ever been in a conversation that you wish ended 10 minutes earlier? No, I mean it because all of a sudden we ended up talking about something or someone we shouldn't have. It all started out so well by the time it was over. Oh, it's just the fly in the ointment. If we would have just kept it holy, kept it brief, and just known when to end it. It says where there is an abundance of words, you're not going to be lacking sin. She knows. Doesn't live on the phone chattering about nonsense. Doesn't have to text and tweet and post every bologna sandwich she makes or every butterfly that flies by. No, she's, she knows words, words are beautiful, words, words are powerful, words are, are precious, words are to be doled out with intentionality about them. God, by words, spoke the universe into existence. God, by words, gave us a gospel that s- saves and transforms souls. Words are not to be cast about like that, and she's, she's careful with them in quantity and in quality. As Proverbs 25, 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Did you get that? It's an apple of gold. Beautiful, right? A golden apple. And it's in a setting of silver. It's not just that the word be right. It's that the setting be right. It's not just speaking something good, but knowing when to say it, how to say it, the volume, the company that's around you. Is this the best time? Is this the best way? Is this the best wording? It's, it's having some kind of tact about her. She's careful with her words. There are women whose worst enemy is their tongue. There are men who suffer from the same malady. But it's your day, ladies. And it says that the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. The teaching of kindness. It just doesn't say that she's kind. But she teaches kindness. Her words are kind for sure, but she teaches others too. Be kind. There is that grace about her. Oh, that that would be said about our women. That words be gentle and kind and that there be instruction from one generation to the next. That she be like the woman in, in the book of Titus, the older woman who teaches the younger woman to be gracious and to be serving and to tend to their families and to do it in, in rightly chosen words. Furthermore, she's healthy and fruitful in her relationships. Healthy and fruitful in her relationship, first of all, with God. I mean, that's central. That's why any of this, you can expect any of this at all to work, is because she is rooted, grounded, anchored in her relationship with the Lord. From the very first proverb, Proverb 1, verse 7, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is central to it. It's the beginning of it. And all the way to this last proverb that we're reading today, in verse 30, it says, a woman who fears the Lord should be praised. This fear of the Lord from the beginning to the end of wisdom, this is it. This is everything. It's a woman who fears the Lord. What are we talking about when we say fearing the Lord? She has a proper sense of the the holiness and the power of the God she serves, making his words and his character her guide. She, She realizes the transcendence of the God that she serves, the glory he deserves, and also... The power that he has to dole out justice upon those who rebel against him. We don't want to take and, 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 and rub the edge off of this 
term, the fear of the Lord. If those of you who've been around church for a while, we just don't hear this enough. You remember when we were, in, when we were kids? Somebody goes wrong, the, the immediate diagnosis was, you know what your problem is? You lack the fear of the Lord. Because you wouldn't be in that mess if you really feared the Lord rightly. It's not this terror that he's evil and that he will unjustly treat you, but neither is it saying, oh, he's, he's a good God. He really doesn't care about what I do. Oh, no, don't, don't, don't chip away at his holiness like that. He is to be feared. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And she has that fear of the Lord. She knows that it is right to do things. She does not want to be on the wrong side of his good pleasure. She fears the Lord, and so her first and most important relationship is with God. I don't have time to work on my spiritual life right now, Pastor, because my marriage is messed up. Let me get my marriage right, and then I'll get close to God. Wrong, fruitless, hopeless. I don't have time. I don't have time to know Jesus right now. I'm worried about my son. You have nothing to share with your son if you don't know Jesus. Her relationship with God was most important. And next was her relationship with her husband. Her relationship with her husband is healthy and fruitful. The excellent woman, the woman who fears God, necessarily if she fears God she fears and understands and respects all that God has to say about what a marriage should look like it is not your place to say well 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 yeah I know what the Bible says but we have this other arrangement and it works just fine for us if it doesn't honor God if it doesn't honor God it's called one thing sin because marriage is not about you and that we've got we've got about three more weeks coming up of some of this good stuff but know this marriage is not about you and what works for you you it's about the glory of god and her relationship with her husband because her first relationship with god is right her relationship with her husband can be right as well look at what verse 11 says the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain he trusts her he trusts her now, this is not that very low standard that the world has today that says, well, I trust my wife, meaning I don't think she's out carrying on with some other guy. This is more, much more than that. This is not that mere trust that, well, I have, I have relative certainty that she's not out with another guy. That's not what this godly man gets to say about this godly woman. When he says he trusts her, he is saying a lot. I mean, look at what the rest of the proverb is saying, really. He, he trusts her with his children's spiritual and physical well-being. He trusts her with his finances. She's buying and selling and moving and shaking. He trusts her in all aspects. He trusts her because he watches her courageously trust God. How do you not trust a woman who's walking in faith and grace and growth in God? How do you not sleep well, men? So he trusts her. But furthermore, it says, he will have no lack of gain. That's an interesting word. It's not, it's not saying if you have a good wife, you're going to be rich financially. You'll be rich in a lot of ways. And your finances will go better with a godly wife. But that's not what he's referencing directly. What he's saying here is that with a, a godly wife, this husband will lack no gain. And that word gain means spoil or plunder. It means that that which is someone else's which you take away. What he's saying is this woman is so godly. She is so full of wisdom. She is so full of grace that he has no temptation to go and take from someone else. Someone else's affection, someone else's wife. He has no desire to go and plunder another relationship for something he's lacking in his. Why? He's not lacking in his. He's got a godly woman. He does not need to go and poach from someone else. He does not need to go and plunder from someone else. He has no lack because his woman is godly. Now, now this is not to make some excuse for any indiscretion some guy made. Well, I made him because my wife wasn't, you know, good. No, you, 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 you have not that place to say that, sir. But it is saying she does not lay him to that temptation because she is a godly woman. He's not running out looking for someone to talk to because she doesn't listen. He's not running out looking for affection because she never has a kind word for him. 
Not finding himself working late because that girl at work at least says hi and bye. No. He finds a grace and a love in his wife. Proverbs 5, 15 through 18 instructs a son, drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered to broad streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. He says, be ravished with her. Let her love satisfy you. You don't need anyone else when she's a godly woman. And he speaks of everything from her companionship to sexually to in every way. You have everything in a godly woman. You won't need to look, wander. You won't have to go about seeking that which you have. He has no need of plunder. Verse 12 says, she does him good and not harm all the days of her life. It doesn't just say she does him good. It says that she does good and not bad. It's not a mixed bag. It's not sometimes she's good, sometimes she's not. Some men live with chameleons don't know who they're coming home to that day. Don't know who's going to greet them at the door. Men timidly come to the knob because God only knows who's on the other side. It could be a kiss or it could be a frying pan. It could be a shout or it could be cruel silence. I don't know. What's wrong? You should know. No, she does good and not bad. She's not a roll of the dice. She's steady. Oh, blessed is the man that has a woman who's always, always in the hands of God, on the agenda of God, anchored in God. And notice her commitment. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. There's not even a whiff of a prenuptial in that. One man, one woman, forever. And forever excellent. Forever godly. And she's determined, and you know some days are harder than others. For the glory of God and trusting in his strength, she's the same from day to day. Her husband is known in the gates, verse 23, when he sits among the elders of the land. This is an interesting phrase. The gates was the place where business was conducted, where treaties were signed, where commerce was settled. It was the place where the elders of the city would come together and make huge decisions about what was going to happen for the entire community. And apparently, this godly woman that this other godly woman is describing to her son, it's only fitting that she have a husband who is in leadership, who has a husband who is of consequence, who is of influence. She has a husband who is respected. And the first thing it says that Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. That means she's done, first of all, nothing to disqualify him from that place. You could not sit in the gates if your wife was a gossiping, philandering so-and-so. So it says much about her that he's sitting there. Furthermore, it says something about her that such a wise and influential man would want her for a wife. It says much about her that a godly, wise man of influence would want her for himself. But it also says something about the kind of man that would have any hope of landing such an excellent woman. Losers need not apply. I mean, really, what business have you courting her? Unless we are of some excellence too. Verse 28 says her husband calls her blessed and praises her. It's a testament to her excellence in loving and ministering to him. But you know, it it says that because it's an instruction as 
to the men as to the proper response that we should have toward a woman of excellence. That's how you respond to a woman of excellence. You rise up and you praise her. You say so. You go public with it. You don't take for granted. She knows. You do it because it's right, because it gives glory to God, and because it affirms her, and because it's true, and because it's the overflow of your heart. It is right. It is mandated by Scripture that we rise up and praise, that we acknowledge God's good graces and an excellent woman. So, I mean, why, why so much emphasis on this marriage thing, Pastor? It's, it's, it's Mother's Day. And, and not all the mothers are married. Not everybody in here is married. And I know that. I understand that. But I also know there's a lot of people here who aren't married at the moment who are mature enough to say, I want other marriages to be strong. I care. It's not all about me. Why so much emphasis on marriage? Because it has a lot to do with motherhood. Because one of the best things that a mother can do for her children is to help place in front of them the model of a good marriage. One of the best things that she can bless her children with is, watch how I love your daddy. Watch how I tend to this home. Watch how I care. That's one of the best things that she can do for her children is to create a sense of normalcy where that kid says it's normal for there to be harmony and love and peace and godliness in a home. It's not rare. Not to him. Not to her. And the child will settle for no less. She blesses them. She blesses her kids. In turn, she blesses her grandkids. She blesses the kingdom of God. She blesses her community. She blesses her world when she has a godly marriage. But not just with her husband. She has a healthy and a fruitful relationship with her children. Throughout this proverb, we've seen her dress them, procure food for them, decorate their home, instruct, instruct them by word and good example. She's a good mother. And therefore, her children, in verse 28, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also and praises her. Her children rise up. It, it is also the right and befitting response to a godly woman for children to frequently, not just on Mother's Day, rise up and say, thanks, Mom. Love you, Mom. I appreciate it, Mom. You have made a difference, Mom. It's right. It's honorable. It says much about the God who gave you that mom. It says much about the gratitude of, of our hearts. And her children call her blessed. Not cool. Blessed. Not buddy. Blessed. heartbreaking to see 50-year-old mom wearing 13-year-old clothes trying to buddy around with her daughter when her daughter needs a godly mother, not another BFF. So want mom to call, so want the kids to call mom cool. So want the kids to call mom friend. No. Let them rise up and call you blessed. Let your children rise up and see the very hand of God and His grace upon you so that they stand in awe of His presence and His working through you so that all that can come out of their mouth is, My mother is a blessed woman. In the praise of her husband and children, the praise that they rise up to give, is given in verse 29. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. They're saying there, there are other excellent women, but there is a, there's a beautiful kind of partiality here. Of the beautiful, you're the most beautiful. And it's right for everyone to say that about your mom. Of the excellent, you're the most excellent. It's a partiality that's acceptable. It makes sense. Her children and her husband in chorus declare their preference for her among all the other excellent women. 
She will always be the apple of his eye. She will always be the beloved mother of her babies. And they will always carry in their hearts the memories of her godliness and her wisdom and her character in the home and outside of the home that has blessed their lives. Now, let me say this. Even if your godliness just began recently, even if your godliness begins today, your children will always remember the change in your life and the godliness that you show from this day forward. Stop looking back, Mom. It's not a day for regrets. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus who makes all the difference. There's not a mother here who doesn't have regrets, just like there's not a father here who doesn't have regrets, just like there's not a son or a daughter here who doesn't have regrets. But there is a Jesus here who is the answer to every single one of us. And in verse 30 and 31, he gives that final homage to such a mother, such a wife, such a woman. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. She has that fear of the Lord. She's driven by that understanding of the transcendence of her God and that guides her and leads her. And verse 30 is, is not saying that, that she is to be either beautiful or God-fearing. She can be both. King Lemuel's mother, a, a woman herself, wisely says that godliness has a deeper, less superficial beauty that is truly praiseworthy. Mom, let me say this. Moms, don't worry. Just the young moms. Middle-aged moms. Just especially the young, the middle-aged, and the old. Okay? Nobody who knows you, nobody who knows you and knows God needs you or wants you to look like the magazine. Your husband... If he's a godly man, he doesn't need you or want you to look like the wedding picture anymore. Don't walk with a limp in your step that your heart be dragging because I'm not that person anymore. After all these years of godliness and all these years of knowing and serving God, all these years of putting His glory and His grace on display, you have a beauty about you that the world cannot imitate and cannot understand or appreciate. We don't need you to be that. We don't need you to be what you were yesterday. You are beautiful today for having served the Lord. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. External, trivial. Topical kind of junk. Nobody's asking that of you. Nobody's asking you to burden yourself with that. That's totally contradictory to the kind of depth of character that he's talking about here. No, mom, don't worry about that. To look like that, to act like that would be a step backward for you. It'd be a step down for an excellent woman. No. We join with verse 31 in praying that God would bring great fruit to all your efforts. Give her the fruit. Give her the fruit of her labors. Give her the fruit of her hands. Let what she's put her hands to do, let it bear great fruit. and Let her breathe her last breath, Lord, with great satisfaction, knowing I lived for God and for others in a way that showed my fear of God, my love for my family, my embracing of my mission as a woman in God's kingdom. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gate. Your reward is sure in Christ. Trust him, serve him, exemplify him, lead your family to him, see him one day. We thank God for his grace upon you. And we rise up and we praise you today.